All right, so let's keep talking about those crosses that Gregor Mendel did. And just a reminder, when we cross something, that means that we're intentionally breeding uh, two different parents in order to examine their offspring or maybe their grandbabies. So Gregor Mendel could and often did perform mono hybrid crosses. Mono means one. So in a mono hybrid cross, you hybridize or mix two individuals that differ in one trait. So in this example, we have a big P, big P purple um, flower. So a homozygous dominant flower that was crossed with a homozygous recessive or little p, little p white flower. When we look at the offspring, we've seen the off, um, we've seen the outcomes of this cross previously. You end up with all purple babies, and that's because the genotype or what the genes say of the F1 sibling hybrids is that they have a big P and a little p. Their genotype is big P, little p. Their phenotype is therefore purple because having one dominant trait means that you're going to see that allele in a traditional cross. Um, his most important monohybrid crosses came from when you crossed two of those F1 siblings to create the F2 generation. And what he found was that 75% of the offspring were purple and 25% of the offspring were white. You can see actually their genotypes here on this chart, how we got those. We haven't talked about that yet, but please note that one purple individual is big P, big P purple. Two individuals are big P, little p, purple, and one individual is little p, little p, white. Um, Mendel's first law, he came up with some laws. He didn't see them as such, but we know that now. But what he found was that her, um, heredity is a particulate. There is a thing that gets passed on from parent to child that determines what they look like. Each true breeding parent contained two of these heredity particles for each of the traits. This is true of the pea plants that Mendel was studying. That is not true for all traits in all things. In human beings, for example, we think you have about 16-ish heredity particles or 16-ish genes, because now we know that that's what those actually are, that dictate your skin tone. But for Mendel, Mendel found that each true breeding pea plant carries two heredity particles or genes for each of the traits that he was studying. These particles have to come apart somehow when gametes are formed so that each parent only passes on one trait into their offspring. So an offspring is 50% mom and 50% dad. However, those particles must be coming together randomly because we know that offspring are not a perfect 50-50 blend, or at least they don't appear that way. Your um, <clears throat> squares can get um, more interesting. You can use them to do different things. This is a test cross. Squares can be used to actually test the genotypes of parents. So in this case, we know that in the parent generation, one of those flowers is um, purple. And we know that one of those flowers is white. Well, from our previous study, we know that that white flower must be little p, little p. What we don't know, however, is um, if that purple flower is big P, big P purple, or if it's big P, little P purple. So when we cross them and we look at the offspring, what we have found was that in this example, 50% of the offspring were purple and 50% of the offspring were white. So it's very different than our traditional experiment where we had big P, big P times little P, little P. So something different is going on here. When he crosses that next generation, again, something different's going on. You have a 50-50 split. And that's because the original flower, the original purple flower, must have been a heterozygote. It must have been big P, little p, rather than big P, big P. So we can use, um, we can use breeding to control the offspring, or we can actually use breeding to learn about the parents. A Punnett square is a really easy way to see how that works. So here is an example of a Punnett square. So we take um, one parent's big P, big P, we take their gametes and we separate them out and we put them on the top of a chart and we make them column headings. You can see those big P's up top. And then we take the other parent and whatever their genomes happen or um, whatever their genotype happens to say, we split that up and we use each genome partner um, to become a row heading and then you essentially just 
fill in the squares. You would take the big P at the top of the column heading and fill in each empty box below it. You would take the row headings off to the left and fill in, fill in each box um, with that. And what you end up with are squares that, were, that are filled out that will tell you the outcomes of um, all the potential outcomes, we should say, of the matings. So in this example, what we see is um, when we pair a big P, big P plant with a little P, little P plant, all of the offsprings, the outcomes in those four boxes, that's how many potential outcomes you have, they're all big P, little P. And we saw that in our experiment. All of those offsprings are heterozygous. Now, if we cross two of those siblings from the F1 generation in this second um, square over here, so we take you know, the first parent, we put it on the top. A big P becomes one column heading. That little P becomes the other column heading. We take the other potential parent and we put it on the side. It doesn't matter which parent goes where as long as they're... Um, their letters as long as their gametes stayed together. So they had a big P and a little P as well. So if we were to fill in that square, we would have um, a very predictable outcome for what those babies would look like. You would have big P, big P in the upper left-hand box, big P, little P in the upper right-hand box, big P, little P in the lower left-hand box, and little P, little P in the lower right-hand box just by clicking and dragging. And you're gonna do a lot of that um, as you learn about Punnett squares and practice that material. Here is um, another example of a test cross in case it didn't quite make sense the first time, but it shows you how this works using our Punnett square. So we have a yellow P and a green P. We know the green P is little y, little y because that's the recessive trait. We know that the yellow one must at least have one big Y, but we're not certain what the other genotype is. If we mix a yellow and a green and all of the babies end up yellow, we know that that little question mark right there in that Punnett square, it must have been a big Y because if that question mark was a little y, as you see in the bottom example, then it must have been a heterozygote. So test crosses can be used to see if the parents are homozygous dominant or if that parent is heterozygous. Um, here is another example, and this actually shows you the outcome of the cross that we did um, two slides ago in case that didn't quite make sense. So you have the original example, big Y, big Y, crossed with little y, little y, and we know that everyone ends up big little because that's your only options. Well, what happens if we cross two members of the F1 generation? We end up with a big Y, little y on the top, and a big Y, little y off to the left. When we carry our column headings down and our row headings across, we end up with one square that's big, big, two squares that are big, little, and one square that's little, little. And what this is tracking is how the chromosomes, how the genes are actually spread among the children when you do these crosses. So you can see down here on the bottom, it lists phenotype and genotype ratios. So that's just another way to write your results. We've been reading them out, but you could say that the genotype ratio in this second example is one big, big to two big littles to one little, little. If you wanted to say phenotype ratio, what do they look like? You would say you have the three yellow to one green uh, phenotype ratio, or you could split that into percentages if you prefer. Three to one is 75 to 25, in case you're not a math person. 75% of the offspring would be yellow, and 25% of the offspring, um, offspring excuse me, would be green. So that's how you do those problems. And you might think, or you might have realized, that if you think back to Mendel's original experiments, those are the ratios that he saw. None of his ratios were perfect. Statistics are never perfect. This is just a predictive outcomes of all of the offspring, but you can still see them um, pretty, pretty straightforward. It is exactly what we would expect if every parent had two heredity particles, they were split evenly amongst the children and you saw offspring as a result. You can get into some probability, really basic statistics when it comes to genetics. So let's talk about those probability basics. Um, in case you haven't studied this before, chance events, we describe them using probability rules and mathematics. Probability, we usually give it as a fraction or a decimal. 
Um, so that decimals, of course, range from zero to one. Some students really prefer thinking about them as actual percentages. You have a 50% chance, a 75% chance. Whatever works best for you is totally fine by me um, and probably by most instructors that you'll run across because we get what you mean. But just in case you have that instructor that wants the decimal, um, remember to change a decimal or to change a percentage into a decimal, just take the percentage off the end and move the decimal to the beginning of the number. So 56% is 0.56 as a decimal, 75% is 0.75 as a decimal, 12% is 0.71, excuse me, 0.12, I'm sorry, I have a cold and I'm very tired. Um, when it comes to those numbers, a probability of zero means that a, an event will not happen, cannot happen. A probability of one means that an event will definitely happen. Um, it's certain, it's 100%, and then anything in between is considered a range. So you can kind of see more examples of those numbers. So if you flip a coin, you have a 50-50 chance, is how you usually hear it said, of that coin landing on heads. So that's a one half percent. Or you can think of it as a decimal, 0 0.5, or you can think of it as a percentage, which is 50%. There are some multiplicative laws in simple probability. Um, so what that means is that the overall chance of something happening um, twice, if those two things are not related, you can multiply them together. So it sounds a little odd. So some people always say, you know, what are the odds that I'm going to have two boys? Well, the chances that you have two boys they're not related. The, uh, the outcome of one pregnancy has nothing to do with the outcome of the other unless, you know, mom has some sort of genetic, you know, there's some sort of reason that mom can't have a boy. Um, so if we were curious, what are the odds that I'm going to have a pregnancy that's two boys? Well, it would be a one half chance times a one half chance, and that's a one fourth chance. So that's the multiplicative law of probability. You can use very simple math rules to look at genetic outcomes. Slightly more confusing, um, there are additive laws of simple probabilities. So when there's multiple ways or multiple um, options for something to happen, the overall probability that you're gonna reach your outcome, how you get there is by adding individual events together. So we can win at our dice game if we roll a four, or we can win at our dice game if we roll a five. The chances of us rolling a four is one sixth because the dice has six sides. And the chances of us rolling a five is one sixth because a dice has six sides. <laughs> so if we're curious, what are the odds that we're gonna win our game if we roll either a four or a five? Well, we just add our two probabilities together. One sixth plus one sixth is two sixths. And if you like math, um, you know that that means that you have a one third chance of winning your dice game. Um, if your options for winning are rolling a four or a five. So you can use examples like that. So we say, you know, what are the chances that we have a boy and a girl? 50% um, chance one time, 50% the next time. You add the two percentages together, and that will tell you the overall outcomes of um, you having that desired sex. <clears throat> you can combine these math laws, and you're, you are um, you will likely have the opportunity to practice this in a lab. HHMI has a heredity lab. If some of these um, problems seem a little intense, I would very strongly suggest you look up HHMI's heredity lab to practice these things, because it's gonna help you. And one of the things that will help you do is combine both laws for complex random events. So say you want to add, um, or to win your dice game, you can roll a four or five, um, in any order. As long as you do that, you have to roll a four and a five in any order. So the chance of getting a five first is one sixth, and you times that by the chance of getting your four, which is one sixth. But if the order doesn't matter, um, you might also roll the your four first, and then you might roll your five second, <laughs> and that's one thirty-six. So the overall chances of you doing either of those things is you have to add those two numbers together. So 136 plus 136 is 236, which give you 118. So that's a little complicated, but if you see, you're just meshing your two laws together. The chances of one thing happening, the chances of another thing happening, add them together, and that's the chance of that event happening overall. And you might be thinking, why in God's name do I care? 
maybe you're looking at heredity examples of what's the chance that I have a boy that has sickle cell? Or what's the chance that I have a daughter who is healthy? What are the chance that I have a pea plant that is purple um, but also wrinkly? You can use your basic math laws in order to figure out those things. Um, or they can be traced on pedigrees, which we'll talk about next.